Hello, welcome to Revenant Reads. I'm Vin, and this is a monthly wrap-up for June of 2024. So I'm going to be briefly discussing, really summarizing, the various books that I read in June of 2024. Uh, all of these books, if you're interested in more thoughts that I might have had. They have all been discussed more at length in my Fresh Red Kills videos, or in the case of these two, in one of my Book Trek 2024 videos. Uh, so I'm not going to go in depth about my thoughts on any of these. This is a summary video that is just kind of wrapping up the month for me. These are things that I do uh, before I put them all downstairs in my library. Right now I'm inside my, my office. This is, these are all my unread books that I've got staring at me. Um, that's a lot, I understand. Uh, but whenever I finish books, after I do these monthly wrap-ups, I bring them downstairs to the library, which are filled with books that I've read and that I'm keeping. Um, so that's kind of a part of a ritual that I have. So without further ado, I'm going to discuss these, again, pretty briefly. Uh, one of the first books that I read in June was Stephen King, The Dead Zone. I read this with Elaine over at Cobalt Dragon. Um, it was fun buddy reading with her. And this is part of my Stephen King reading project. I am not reading every single book that Stephen King has read, I'm sorry, has written, um, but I am reading every book that I own that Stephen King has written. And that would include these books on this shelf and uh, those ones as well. So every month or every other month or so, I am reading King's books in general, well, publication order, at least the ones that are on my shelves. Um, so that was coming up for this, and this was also part of the uh, kind of banned book reading challenge that's been going on on BookTube. Um, this was found on banned book lists uh, back in the 1990s. Um, now, of course, it wasn't entirely banned, but it was challenged, certainly. I don't really know all the reasons for it. Uh, you know, I basically looked at the banned book uh, banned books list, and then I saw what was on my shelf, and I decided, okay, I'm going to read those books this year, whichever things fit. And this is one of them. So I had two reasons to read this. <clears throat> and this was, I would say, okay. Um, certainly not the best King book that I've read so far. Um, I was already familiar with the Cronenberg film, so I did the storyline. And I had seen some of that series that was on about 20 years ago uh, that was also based on this. And I like the premise. I like the central character and how he's written. I wasn't crazy about some of the writing for the, a lot of the other characters. Um, I thought that our main villain, uh, Greg Stilson, was eh, kind of cartoonish in some ways. Uh, I think King really went heavy on what a villain that guy is, but it actually wasn't entirely necessary, I think, to the plot and um, for our main character's decision to do what he did. Um, and uh, I also had some issues with some of the structure of the book. Um, I wish that more characters were sort of um, seen throughout the book, but it seems like they, a lot of characters are introduced and then just sort of dropped and you don't really see or hear much of them ever again. So this was okay. Uh, I'm glad I read it. I'll put it down in my library, but um, definitely not a favorite of mine. Um, I guess I'll stick with the fiction that I read first. I'll just go that way. Um, I also read two things about Star Trek. Um, I am the creator of a booktube event that happens at this point, this is the fourth summer that it's happened, um, that it's Book Trek. So Book Trek is really all about just reading Star Trek fiction. I've got some co-hosts that go along with me for this, and I've got some people participating. It's just a lot of fun. It's just a geeky way to do things. Um, for me, Star Trek fiction has always been like um, a summer read for me. That's like my, my version of a beach read. And I read Yesterday's Sun, which I'll talk about first, I guess, um, by A.C. Crispin. This was originally published in the early 1980s. I think it was 1983. Yeah, um, and I like this one quite a bit. Uh, this was kind of a sequel to an original series episode in which Spock um, goes back in time on a planet and uh, makes love to a woman. And we see the repercussions here where he finds out he has a son 5,000 years ago and goes back in time basically to retrieve him. And I had a lot of fun with this. I thought that the plot moved swiftly. It was very character driven. And um, overall, just a, a really good way to begin my summer of Book Trek. Um, I do plan to, in July, read the sequel to this book. I also read just this graphic novel here, Star Trek Year 5, Experienced in Loss. This is supposed to be about um, 
if basically if Star Trek had had a fifth season, it only had three seasons, the original series, but it was on a five-year mission. So what would the fifth year or fifth season have been like? And this is the fourth volume in it, and fourth and last. So I didn't read the ones before this, but there were some okay things in this. Um, the artwork was just fine. Uh, we had some good stories involving things like time travel. Um, and <clears throat> there were some also some stories that left a little bit more to be desired, like this one about Kirk trying to, you know, marry a woman. Um, but it was okay. Uh, not a strong recommend, but if you like graphic novels, if you like the original series, you might find, you might have fun with this. Okay. Um, I guess I'll go to this one next. <laughs> Uh, Genghis Khan and the Making of the Modern World by Jack Weatherford. This was a book that came out, what, like 20-something years ago now? Uh, let's see if I can... This was 2004, so yeah, so 20 years ago. Uh, and it was very, very popular when it came out. I just finally got around to reading it. Um, and really, this is more of a an attempt to correct um, the reputation of Genghis Khan uh, across the world in history. Uh, this is very much a revisionist type history. It is to see Genghis Khan more from the Mongolian point of view and to absolve or exonerate him of many of the terrible things that he was accused of. Now, I don't know if it's entirely successful at that. Um, you do get the sense that you are, this is not an unbiased look. Uh, it is really interesting though. I definitely learned quite a bit. And Genghis Khan's um, life that is told, especially in the first half of this book, is just fascinating. I mean, it's there's like a cinematic quality to it, and it really drew me in. Um, but it does make a pretty good case of how things like Europe really benefited uh, from the empire that Genghis Khan ended up building, and then his, uh, you know, his, his predecessors, um, or sorry, his, you know, well, whatever, his son, grandson, the sort of empire that they built, how Europe really benefited from it, um, how at least in our sense, it was very forward-looking in some ways. Um, it does kind of pan over all the people that were murdered, though, during that time. So not, like I said, not a balanced look at Khan, but a really interesting one. Um, I'll stick with the history. Another history book that I read. This is, And that was for actually, and this one, were for um, Historathon 2024, where we read... Uh, discuss and celebrate nonfiction history. Uh, quarter two, the event is broken up into four quarters, looked at the years 500 to 1500. So I read this for that, and I also read this for the, that as well. And this was okay. I had a slow start to it, but in the end, I ended up getting into it, and I loved all the illustrations that were in here. I thought that they were very nice, very nicely printed, actually, uh, and helped with the uh, understanding of the text. Uh, McCall's writing um, takes some getting used to. He's very long-winded sentences. You're not always entirely sure where he's going with certain things. But uh, once it finally kicked in, I thought it was quite fascinating. And what it does, it looks at people in medieval society who didn't fit in. Um, this can be uh, heretics, homosexuals, um, even things like bandits, uh, people being accused of sorcery and witchcraft. Uh, and you get, of course, the um, terrible punishments that they would receive. Uh, and he gets an explanation for why um, the tolerance seemed to actually slip as time went on. Um, but one of the things that really struck me was you get the sense of how diverse medieval world really was and how many different types of people there were, how many different types of opinions. Um, and not everybody was, you know, ready or willing to conform. Uh, so I ended up liking this book um, a decent amount. Uh, maybe not in the first third or so that I read, but definitely the last two thirds, um, I was, uh, going through it pretty quickly. Another Historathon read is this one here, The Owl and the Nightingale, a new verse translation by Simon Artemidge. This is a 12th or 13th century poem that they don't know a lot about, but it is essentially an owl and a nightingale insulting each other. And it was written in Middle English. And this edition has the Middle English on one side and Simon Artemidge's translation on the other. And Artemidge gives a nice little brief introduction explaining why he translated what he did or how. And it just was a very entertaining read. Um, it's pretty funny. 
in a lot of ways. Uh, they have some pretty clever insults that, you know, these two birds are basically throwing back and forth at each other. It doesn't give a whole lot in terms of context. Um, I guess there's a lot of theological stuff going on that I just didn't know because, again, the, this book doesn't provide it. But um, just on a kind of, you know, surface level, this can be enjoyed quite a bit. So I would recommend it. And we're, I think Princeton University Press would have a pretty nice addition there. All right, two more books I've got here. Um, talk about this one. Sagan, Carl Sagan, The Varieties of Scientific Experience, A Personal View of the Search for God. Uh, this was originally published in the early 2000s after Sagan had passed away from cancer. And these are basically lectures that he gave in uh, the 1980s um, for, it was, was it the Gifford Lectures? Yeah, the Gifford Lectures, in Scotland, I guess. And the Gifford Lectures, I guess, look at, um, from what I understand from what I remember from what the book saying, um, they look at theology from a uh, kind of more rational point of view and more evidence-based. Um, and he gave a bunch of lectures that looked at things like uh, intelligence in the universe, um, the possibility of extraterrestrial intelligence in life, uh, things like looking at the um, arguments for God's existence and why a lot of them is don't really hold water. Um, a lot of things he touches on. And I am a big fan, excuse me, of Sagan. I've always loved his writing. Uh, this was also, this hardcover edition at least, um, was really nicely done too. Uh, I'm gonna try and find their full color, full color illustrations. Things were updated because these aren't necessarily the things that he showed in the 80s because by the early 2000s, they had much better views. But really, really like this. And of course, the title is a take on uh, James's uh, Varieties of Religious Experience. And uh, I really, really like this. So um, I said in my video, this is kind of, you know, if, if somebody wanted to know my my core religious views, it would be something like this, uh, you know, what, what Sagan is saying, um, much more scientifically based, rational, I am an atheist. However, I have been indulging in some other interests that uh, I don't see as being separate from this. It's more of a, a supplement to um, add a little bit more enchantment to life. So I've been looking at things like paganism, especially I've taken an interest in pagan ritual and the power of story and myth. Uh, just to kind of enrich life and to focus my attention on things that, as scientifically minded as I can be, I just don't give that much attention to. And I'm trying to find ways that will tap into my more primitive part of my brain <laughs> that will make me want to focus on things. Uh, I'm trying to be very brief in this, and I'm sorry if I'm not making a lot of sense, but that's not really the point of this video. It is just to summarize books. But with that in mind, okay, so one of the things that I have been attracted to is like Norse paganism. Um, I like the myth, I like the rituals that are involved. Uh, I'm fascinated by uh, what we know of Norse religion, I mean, historically. Um, so I read this with that in mind. Um, and again, I'm, I'm kind of going through looking for things like ritual and, um, and story and myth. And I actually, I like this quite a bit. I thought this was pretty good. Uh, this is the second book on heathenism or Norse paganism or also true that I've read. And I like this one better than the first. This was written by Matthias Nordvig, um, who I think is like a lifelong heathen. Uh, but he also, you can see PhD, he does have, I think, a doctorate in like Norse mythology. And he lays out a pretty good introduction to, to heathenry. Uh, and he leaves a lot of personal interpretation open for the reader. Um, he does not necessarily stress the fact that you have to approach things from a, a you know, strongly polytheistic view. You can approach it from an animist view. Um, so I think he leaves enough open for people to kind of adopt things in their own way, but he's still giving a pretty good guide for, uh, you know, what you can expect. Now, I had said in my video, it does say a modern heathen's guide. This is not a how-to, um, so it's definitely an introduction. I think God might be pushing it a little bit more, but um, I like this enough where I bought a book on paganism from the same publishers, uh, and I actually just finished reading it this morning. Uh, didn't like it as much as this, but this was a pretty good read. And that's it, finally. Um, those are all the different books that I read in June of 2024. I'm gonna try and make my stack here. So, 
they're in different order now, but some way the stacks work. Uh, I got a, a Star Trek um, graphic novel. We've got Genghis Khan, The Making of the Modern World, The Medieval Underworld, The Owl and the Nightingale, The Varieties of Scientific Experience, Asa True for Beginners, uh, Yesterday's Sun, and The Dead Zone. If you've read any of these, I'd love to hear your thoughts on them. And as always, thank you, BookTube.